right, Howie, we're back, and it's episode four, and uh, we're excited to dive into the book of Acts, chapter 17 again, and thanks to Sean last week, we had a lot mm. to think about, um, and now we're diving into just five verses this week, verses 10 to 15, and really what we're going to talk about today could be one of the most boring things in people's minds, but it's actually the most crucial, and it's preaching. <laughs> <laughs> So how's that for an introduction? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so um, in context, essentially, Paul and Silas are uh, still going from place to place, and then they end up with the Bereans. And so these are people that are, um, the passage talks about them being more noble, but I think in context of it, it's really, they're more in tune or more open to the gospel, essentially. Um, I know you preached it, not me, but <clears throat> I'm trying to just summarize quickly. Um, but do you want to just take us through your thought pattern behind um, what we're going to discuss today, just about sermons in general? Yeah, off of Sunday, just wanted to break down what does it mean to really listen to a sermon? So we go to church, we're part of a service on a Sunday morning, and then how do you grow? So when it comes to that time where God's word is opened and it's proclaimed, uh, the heart is that we would be listeners who received it, uh, that we would even go deeper and like even researching off of Sunday that passage, that we'd have a resolve to be part of community, meaning that I'd have a resolve to show up week after week to hear the word of God being preached and then the heart behind any of any time God's word is proclaimed or taught is that we'd respond so the spirit of God does something mm -hmm. in those moments if we're open to hearing that so that's the heart behind uh, sort of this passage and making it applicable to us here at uh, here at our churches I guess um, the next question to ask then is how, how often have people been bored listening to your sermons? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think every sermon probably has people bored <laughs> I, in it. <laughs> it's funny, right? Because as preachers, you know, we prepare, we picture what it's like to preach it. Uh, I'm not a sermon practicer. I don't know. Do you practice at home in the mirror? I, I used to yeah. in the past. The more that I've done it, I'll, I don't have to preach it out loud, but I will go through it pray through it yeah s sort of just more internally than externally but yeah i used to preach it out loud all the time yeah i always found that weird um yeah i don't i don't i i just felt too self-conscious even literally being alone i felt like what are you doing you're crazy yeah <laughs> talking to yourself when i was in bible college when i first started like preaching I had it was a weird phase of my life it was this phase where I had all these stuffies like these teddies yep. and so I'd actually I remember being in my dorm room and I had them all on the bed you had and, stuffies yeah, at, I know. <laughs> at bible college and that's why I said it was a weird phase I was going through <laughs> so I were I they care bears <laughs> yeah I, I didn't have a ton but I had like my my first my first teddy bear I got when I was younger and a few others but I I remember setting them up on my bed at my my bunk bed and then I'd step back and I would I was practicing my sermon that I was going to preach either before the class or before the school body so I did have that sort of weird phase yeah yeah I find when when you practice it in your head yeah and I would go through it a number of times just to see does this make sense am I talking too much is it too little knowing that I'm going to ramble at certain points like well they call it extemporaneous mm -hmm. right <clears throat> which basically is just like a whole bunch of extra words not necessary um, but oftentimes when you get into the moment of preaching and I would say this is for the preacher as well as the listener there's a certain point in a speech or a sermon where you tune out and I've actually found sometimes I get to a certain spot in a sermon and I'm like I'm not even liking this <laughs> you know what I wrote down it sounded cool in my head and you know I'm gleaning from different sources and stuff like that and I'll you know attribute to commentaries but in the end it's like that that realization listening to yourself it's almost like you're looking out of body and going you're boring <laughs> that you need to move on from this 
And I do have conversations with myself while I'm preaching or with God, literally like the Holy Spirit sometimes gives you that uncomfortableness, like press on, yeah. or maybe you're, you're, you've fallen into the trap of ramble. Um, it takes a long time to, to get to the point where you have that discernment. Um, do you ever have that when you're preaching or once you're up there, you just give her? Yeah, I, I think all preachers would have what you just shared. Uh, so there, there's moments when, when I'm preaching where I would go, there's a certain part, because I think you're trying to mix proclamation with teaching. Mm -hmm. So as a pastor, you want to you wanna equip people. So there's moments where you might zero in on something and give more of a historical context. Right which would take away from like the proclamation and which is how i was trained gotcha. it's more yeah. important the context and the the detail than it is about how exuberant you are about the reason why you're preaching yeah and and i go you become more excited in it especially if the sermon hit home to you like so i always say for a preacher you preach to yourself first mm -hmm. so that when you in a way stand up on a Sunday and you proclaim it, it's coming from a personal, passionate heart that's been impacted by it. Yeah. But there's moments in every sermon, I think, because you want to be also a teacher, uh, like I was saying, and help helping people, equipping people, you want to dive in and go a little deeper. So you might go, you know, the Greek meaning here is is this, but then all of a sudden the next sort of bend in the road, you're, you're moving around, you're passionate, yelling a bit however that comes out in your personality yeah, yeah. yeah you have you have like there's f say there's five gears you get to like fourth gear and then you start to get louder and then yeah. when you get to fifth gear it's like the last 10 minutes is just <laughs> like oh yeah because i know i'm running out of time so <laughs> yeah. so like i better i better uh sort of land this thing and that's yeah. why the fifth gear it goes yeah you're yeah. You're going basically all, on all cylinders, right? Well, and it's funny because when you're talking about the Greek, and it just rolls off Sean's tongue. Yes, absolutely. But that's because of his his background and education, right? Mm -hmm. Because he he immer whatever you immerse yourself in, you tend to it draws out. Yeah, right? that and spiritual giftings. I go. Sean definitely would have had. Uh, he has the spiritual gift of knowledge. So yeah. to even remember Greek words and then remember how to pronounce them. I'm like, no, no, not down my alley. And, and the four ways that it could be interpreted. Exactly. Right? Because again, in the Greek, you, it could be like one sentence could have multiple meanings based on the, the way a certain word is used. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think that um, although I, I value education, um, I don't necessarily think it's a pre-qualifier of the ability to preach. And without going into that rabbit hole, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I say that just to say, um, <clears throat> when you're when you're going to preach, you're making sure that it's factual, that it's truth. You're preaching truth. You're not adding opinion or your own thoughts into it, unless you're qualifying a statement. Um, but <clears throat> but again, how do we how do we battle the boredom that can set in with a thirty to forty minute sermon? And maybe even before we talk about the boredom part. <laughs> Is there a formula for how long a sermon should be to avoid the boredom? You know, like there's churches out there mm. that are 15 minutes and it's 20 or uh, 35 minutes of music and 10 minutes of announcements and, you know, whatever after that. Um, and then there's churches that are 15 minutes of music <laughs> and an hour long sermon and that's it. Yeah. And then there's churches with no music. It's just, or no musicians. So... Is there a special number where you've taught in Bible college? It has to be this. Yeah, there, there was never really a special number, but I grew up in the time where a sermon was 30 minutes. Yeah. So, and, and I think we were all sort of taught along those lines. Uh, were you marked that way? <laughs> we, we, were, we were never really, I think in Bible college, I preached one sermon that was allowed to be 30 minutes other than that, they were sort of, I, I, I'd use the term more short devotional, mm, inspirational yeah. thoughts that are being proclaimed. Like you could preach a 15 minute sermon. I, I just think in our, in our culture, people have run to the keep it shorter because people don't have that much uh, like attention span anymore mm -hmm. and all that. But uh, when when you include the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, I, I believe you can you can preach 
even like longer than that and people will grab parts like you mentioned about there's parts of a message right like even as a preacher where you tune out somewhat and uh that's like listeners like mm -hmm. when we listen there's moments where i'm really engaged moments where i'm not as engaged but then i come back and i hear something so i go over the the if, if you preach a 45 minute to an hour sermon people will come in and out of it but you never know sort of what nuggets they'll sort of mine up uh, yeah from it so i'd go there's no particular time uh, unless you're in a, uh, a system of a church where they are like, no, you can only preach 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even in our context, because we we have a finite amount of time because we rent a movie theater and movies are going to come and start automatically. So we can't just say, hang on a second. Um, <clears throat> so I think there are, it's still good to have some boundaries. I mean, there's churches out there. They'll just go for two and a half, three hours. I've been to Jamaica and other places where churches all day because it includes gathering and meal and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but in our context, um, it's a finite amount of time, but I think that's okay. Um, but yeah, people are going to come tune in and tune out. There's a lot of ADD people out there like <laughs> me that I'm thinking of, you know, the lights on the wall and the, you know, how many people are in the room and do I know that person? And my brain can go a mile a minute and it's not intentionally rude. It's not meaning to say, I don't want to listen to Howie. Uh, it's just kind of how we're wired sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's lots of people that can relate to that where um, I find if I listen to like a radio drama, for example, I like listening to it when I'm driving because it makes the time go um, quicker, but I, I tend to remember more listening to a drama than just sitting, listening to somebody talk like a, like just talking theology, mm -hmm. unless it's something I'm passionate about. Exactly. Yeah. But, and so if we want to transition into the, how do we prepare ourselves then at that point? Cause I know when I go turn something on that I enjoy, I've already prepared myself to immerse myself in that storyline. Um, Absolutely. So if we take the passage, um, people know at center point what's coming next because we're going systematically through the book of Acts. So they know it's the next part of cha chapter 17. So people could be, I'll, I won't say should be, but could be in their week um, opening up the Bible and getting the context. So when you preach it, you're just expanding on something they already know and might learn something new. Um, but that whole preparing the heart thing, it, you know, it, are there practical ways of doing that? I don't know. Everyone's different. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Go, like what you said about reading the passage, I go like, there's no spoilers with, with the Bible. Like, yes. So like, we're not like, in, I'm not anticipating, for example, this coming Sunday that people are unfamiliar with that passage. I go, mm -hmm. if you're a Christian, you should be familiar with it. And if you read ahead, it's not going to spoil Sunday morning. Right. So I'm, I'm with you on the, the reading ahead, thinking it through. I go, there's, pra to me, it's, it's practical things. It's like, okay, I'm going to pray, pray through uh, this coming week so that when I engage Sunday morning, I prayed it through and I'm, I'm alert. Uh, the Bereans were eager. So I go like, have this excitement, this eagerness that like, wow, like we get to go to a church service here today at the Cineplex. Uh, we're going to worship Jesus. We're going to open up God's word. Uh, for some, uh, this was, I remember my mentor saying this to me, and this was even before I was really pastoring but he would always tell me prepare for sunday by making sure you start on saturday evening mm -hmm. so things like finding proper like rest uh filling my mind with things that would be actually helpful rather than distracting and pulling me away so that way when i come to sunday morning it's bigger than just sitting there's a mission we're on in the body of christ and then I want to hear his word. Like there's a respect when it comes to God's word or there should a reverence, be yeah. a, a reverence, like, like, wow, like today God's word's going to be opened. It's going to be brought forth and proclaimed. I don't want to miss what God might have for me. So I would go, I think there's a prep to it so that when you come Sunday morning, it's not like you just sort of flew in and you're like, all right, what's happening? Yeah. And I mean, you're talking as a preacher, 
but then there's everybody else and it's that same prep essentially is what you're saying yeah. you're not just talking about you as the preacher although this is that's likely your routine <clears throat> i know for me yeah if i'm dog tired on a sunday morning and then i have to be involved in ministry I'm not the nicest person. I'm not mm. being mean. Just I, I get, I have to get into myself and then just do what I need to do. I don't. When, when the bubbly people walk in the room, I'm like, oh man, this is gonna suck me dry. Yeah. <laughs> um, especially if you have to be the communicator that day and you want to, you know, be positive and try to be ready. But if you're tired or worn out or sick or whatever. Um, that's when you need the Holy Spirit to uh, fill the tank for you. <laughs> yeah, and those weeks, those weeks will be there, absolutely, right? Yeah. So, but then, yeah. So we we really, if we have one plea to our people, it's to come prepared, to to pay attention, um, whether that means eating before you come, making sure you got coffee in your hand if that's the thing that you like. Um, get lots of rest so you're not using this time to do extra sleep. Um, and I, I realize it's in a darker room and things like that, but, um, and we have comfy seats, but, um, you know, get up, stretch, move around, but the whole community aspect should, it should make the room alive, right? Yeah. We, we don't want to just be, um, a bunch of walking zombies. It, we should be telling people to calm down because we want to start the service. <laughs> That's my hope anyways for Sunday morning. Yeah. And, and I go like, it, it's like you have, you have this, uh, hope and this promise really like that god's word never turns void mm -hmm. so if you picture it this way like if I, I i love the sport of baseball so if i knew like my favorite player growing up was frank thomas uh with the chicago white Sox, played with the jays for a while but mm -hmm. if he was putting on a hitting clinic and we were sitting in a room and he was going to talk about this is how you approach hitting a baseball I would actually be really engaged in listening to him mm -hmm. because I'm going, the guy did it in his career, uh, like he hit the ball well, yeah. and then I want to hear that. So I'm not going to be in the room sleeping. Yeah. So when I come to a Sunday morning, even when I wasn't a preacher and I'd be there, I was working at, okay, like this individual who's going to proclaim today God's word has studied, prayed through the week, uh, and now he's proclaiming it, but there's something God has for me. I don't want to be sleeping when God's going to use that to say, hey, mm -hmm. get that into your heart, get that or into your life. Or just tuned out. Or tuned out, just distracted. Like checking We're in, Instagram. Yeah, and, yeah. You nailed it. Yeah, yeah, our phones are a big thing now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to be focused these mm -hmm. days, right? And I think it's that we are so... Um, we're so attacked by media that when we actually do have to set a, set things aside, there's this like dopamine hit that we, we need. So we're looking for it. And then that's why, you know, like if, unless you take your phone and you put it in a bag or something, every 15 seconds, your brain goes, check it, check, check it, it, check yeah. it. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I don't think people are being rude when they open their phone. And there's lots of people that I use. I've got the Bible app on here right now to reference it. Yeah. Um, but we can easily judge people wrongly um, for that scenario. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's that, like, and then there's preferences, right? Like church services, people are like, oh, man, I'm all about the music. So, and when, you know, Akilah sings on Sunday, man, I'm just engaged. So I'll, I'll come the weeks that Akilah's leading mm -hmm. or I'll come the weeks that Dan's leading. We get into that consumeristic mindset where we have our favorite coffee shop, our favorite chair in the coffee shop, <laughs> yeah. our favorite experience. Yeah. So how do you, how do you battle all of that? Right. I mean, when we're dealing with preferences. Yeah. And, and I don't think we, we necessarily have to battle it. It's, it's just going, there's things that you might enjoy more, but it doesn't mean what you enjoy less is not good. Uh, so there's certain music we like, Hmm. but doesn't mean that all the other music is horrible. Right. So likewise, there's, and, and that's like with preaching, there's different preachers and teachers, and we all have sort of the ones we sort of make time for and listen to. But I'd go, whoever's preaching, there should just be a respect for God's word, no matter what. And uh, that engagement in it would be us doing sort of the hard work. So I'd go, the last thing we'd want to do is like, 
I'd never like call someone out if they were on their phone and be yeah. like, Hey, you should be looking at your Bible. And then, or finishing your sentence with right, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a few times I've wanted to do that. Um, again, when you've worked youth ministry, you know, you have like this 10 minute window of attention span. <laughs> Um, so you tend to just call you kids can be called out without it being devastating to them an adult not so much yeah. <laughs> how dare well, you yeah so I go having environments where hopefully people are going to be open to what the Spirit of God is doing in their life mm-hmm. uh, so I'm not there as a communicator when I'm preaching to judge people's response like sometimes with music on a Sunday morning I find that can be dangerous because mm-hmm people will evaluate a good worship set on did people raise their hand did they move around did they clap Uh, rather than like were people's hearts really given over to jesus were they singing to the audience of one there's moments where you know you might be walking through something and you're worshiping through praise but you might not be able to get those words out because it's heavy so I find sometimes mm-hmm. we do damage in the church by judging. So even when people, for example, fall asleep, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to jump on that and just be like, oh, you know, they just don't It's value. a reflection of you. Yeah, because yeah. I go sometimes, especially being a, a dad, right, of two young kids, sometimes sleep is hard to get. Yeah. And uh, you might be sitting, like you said, you're in a dark theater, you might, close your eyes and you might be out it's so. the quietest moment of your day yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah 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 um yeah and it says in the passage they receive the word with eagerness so what does it mean to receive the word with eagerness or does that mean like like an open heart mind um explain the characterization of that yeah the, the way i look at it is like if okay there's the baseball world series that's a that's going on so let's just say it goes to game seven so it's like you're going to anticipate game seven like i did with the blue jays in the early 90s (laughs) yeah joe carter yeah Yeah. like when we were younger right for for us yeah yeah and and there was this anticipation this eagerness like uh, so during the day i'm like I'm sort of somewhat like giddy. I'm nervous. I'm I'm excited. I have like this butter butterfly feeling in my mm-hmm. stomach, just excitement. And I go like to receive the word of God with eagerness. There's there's this moment I think where we're like, wow, like I get to go to this church service today. We're going to sing praise to Jesus, but then the word of God's going to be opened up. And I know God, and I know that when His word is open and proclaimed, He speaks. And so I'd go, there's an eagerness to be like an anticipation, uh, this joy to go, I'm ready to receive what God has for me today. Yeah. So, so it's, it's <clears throat> the preparing your heart thing. It's not like you have a special moment in, in, before you go to the service where you have to sit and prepare your heart. Yeah. It, this, this, we're talking about lifestyle now. We're really getting to the point where we want our people engaged throughout the week. And then the sermon is the culmination of the preparation. So we want your lifestyle to be loving and serving Jesus. So you're enamored by the word because it's impacting what happens on a Tuesday as much as what happens on a Sunday morning. Um, And then that anticipation is that exuberance and excitement is a being in the community of people who are like-minded or you're new to this and, and you're energized by the fact that people, this is meaningful. And then number two is um, it's living and in, in active, right? Like if, if you actually love Jesus, you need to love the word I and mean, he is the word. And <clears throat> so it's, it's that sustenance. It's like the best meal of the day. Mm. But oftentimes we, we almost plan to forego the meal. You know, it's, oh, I have to go, I have to do this. It's, and that's where it's that religion bent versus relationship bent (laughs) where I know what to expect on a Sunday because I'm I'm the type of person that if I think people get so stagnant and so um, expectant I want to just change it up just to disrupt (laughs) and if that means stand in a different spot have a different preacher not do music the same way you know change the location whatever it is I just feel like sometimes we need a disruption 
Um, but I realize I'll, all I'm doing is I'm trying to fix other people's problems and that's not my goal. Mm. So in my head, I can tell when people are, are not um, receiving it. Um, but we're not the fixers. We're supposed, it's, you know, there's the saying about the foolishness of preaching, right? We're not God. Mm -hmm. We're just supposed to proclaim his word and then he does the work. So at the end of the day, we, we can't, and that's why you get into ego trips as pastors. If not everybody's engaged and they're not clapping and cheering and wooing and all that kind of stuff, you're not effective. That's actually just a sinful emotion. I need that validation where at the end of the day, you don't need validation as long as you're being obedient. Yeah. And I go as long as you're being obedient. Absolutely. But then also that you're like as a pastor, you've, for example, you've studied all week, you've prayed through, you've prepared. So be faithful to that Mm -hmm. because there's sermons. And I think if every pastor was honest, they would go, I walked away from that sermon. I don't think it was that great. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad it'll be the last time I ever do that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's it's those moments where you're like, yeah, I could have maybe communicated that a little better, more effectively. But then those are the ones I go, God just seems to use those. So you got to really check your heart mm-hmm. often as a communicator, as a pastor, because you can get a ton of people responding an emotional response, but it could be very shallow. Yeah. Or you could have a sermon where, man, that took a lot to get out uh, and walk away. There's moments where you're like, I hope that made sense because you're trying to explain and teach something that might be a little more difficult and deep and it's not as practical and inspirational. Mm. And you walk away and you're like, yeah, people probably weren't too pumped up or positive there <laughs> because it's very convicting. It's sort of fly in your face. So yeah. I would go just be faithful. Uh, so if it, if it's a passionate one that really connects with you, if it's something you took you a while to study through and you're like, all right, I'm just going to be faithful to the text and proclaim that the spirit of God has a way to wrap it all up and impact people. And, uh, that's the good news. If it's a, it it should be a gift. Like as a preacher, you go, there's a gift of preaching. Uh, hopefully we're using the gift. (laughs) Are there times where, where you've just thought that you literally dropped the tools and you, you didn't accomplish the goal. And then somebody messaged you saying, you know, I'm so glad that you shared that this week because I needed exactly that message. Yeah. <clears throat> Throughout ministry, you always have those things popping up. Yeah. So I would go the sermons sometimes that I think, Oh, this is really going to hit land. <laughs> nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the ones where you're like, Oh, this is going to be hard to get through yeah. are the ones that, like I said, God just has a way where he's like, I'm just going to use that. So I go just be faithful to the study, to putting it together and then proclaim it. But the, I go in proclaiming it, it has to hit home first. So if you're preaching on something that hasn't hit your heart or you haven't in a way processed through as you proclaim that there's going to be, I I say no power or no passion because sometimes we can proclaim without passion well my wife and i have always said that the week that i have to preach whatever the passage is tends to become what we have to deal with in our life Mm -hmm. not always specifically but there's usually a circumstance happening through in our life where i have to eat my words and i have to literally like i'm i'm preaching this like you said before to myself because i I'm not qualified to be able to say this <clears throat> because I'm, I'm dealing it. with whatever's going on. Yeah. So you, you, we had, we have to get punched in the face first. That's like the word of God. If you can picture it, like a hand coming out and just slapping you, <laughs> punching you because I'm like, that's what hits because when I communicate that I'm not doing it in, in a prideful way, I'm doing it in a humble way. And then I'm bringing in my own humanness like yeah. that like I mess up, I fail, but thank goodness for God's grace and thank goodness for his word that upholds me and lifts me up and challenges me. And I go, if communicators can be authentic and real like that, and the text sort of is part of your life, when you stand up to proclaim that, it's going to be impactful because people see, okay, that touched you. Yeah. Well, and this isn't anything that you wrote down that we're going to talk about, but I thought about this when I, when I was called to be in ministry 
and to do music and to preach and to and to share God's word, I <clears throat> I really did feel compelled and called, um, even out of my own ability and understanding. And I am not a theology student who has a master's degree in whatever. Um, but then I, I was reminded from one of my mentors who's in his 90s now, missionary for 50 years. And he said that God, God will call men and the education is to supplement and, and, and make you whole. It's not that's your calling is to be a scholar. And then once you're a scholar, then you're equipped and ready to do the work of the ministry. Um, I think sometimes the mentality is we've got it backwards and we expect the master's degree or doctoral student theologian to be qualified before I'll even listen to them. Yeah. And then I think about the disciples, you know, like, uh, I don't know what your perspective is on that coming from a Bible college student, but I have Bible college, but because I didn't check all all of the boxes the perception is i'm not good enough right? yeah so like how do you deal with that right when i look at the scriptures um and i think about the disciples jesus said go to that town and they're like i don't know what to say i have no what but it became part of their heart and their life and their they were astute to what jesus was teaching them and then they were going and resharing it we're just resharing scripture Right. Yeah. So it's not like I have to learn the entire, you know, Greek alphabet to figure it out. And I know it sounds cynical, but um, that that's been a recurring theme over the last 15 years for me of what does it mean to actually be a qualified to be a preacher? Yeah, for example. Yeah. And I think you nailed it with the, with the calling like to to be a preacher is that you're called into it. It's not like one day you're like, oh, I think that'd be a good gig. Uh, right. Right. And, and I've heard all the jokes and you have. Because I can't do anything else. I'll just <laughs> preach. <laughs> that uh, you work one day a week, all this yeah. type of stuff comes in. And, and I get the the gist of the jokes and that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm like, it's definitely the calling. Now, depending who we are and how God's created us and and that comes out to play right like not most pastors aren't scholars uh some of us we have to really study to show ourselves approved meaning yeah. there's passages i've preached on where i'm like it took longer for me to really get my mind wrapped around it whereas a friend i have a friend in in winnipeg who is an apologetic Mm -hmm. And he, and I always said, you could explain the Bible better than I could ever explain it. But I'm the one in the office, for example, a pastor. Yeah. Uh, but he had a gift of teaching. He, he could remember things and then he could like uh, put it together in, in unique ways. And then I go, both of us probably have a calling to preach and teach. It just looks different. Yeah. So his style of communication would be different than mine. So I, I just go, some of it's like, who, who has God created us to be? How does our personality come out in our communication? The number one thing, though, is calling. Yeah. Uh, I've never had, uh, for example, people sit with me and go, like, what was your, what was your uh, average at Bible college? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been ordained, I've been asked questions, and I've been approved by a council that said, all right, you can properly handle the word of God. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't need that because I've been called and I know I've been called by God through his spirit. So I go, that's neat that other people can recognize you have a gifting, but I don't bank on that. Yeah. So that's where I sort of fall is like, if, if you want to pursue education, absolutely go pursue it. Uh, if you if you don't and you have a calling, but you do need to understand God's word, I'd go yeah. if you're just getting up and saying a bunch of stuff. I remember I preached once and this young guy came up to me. He's like, let's have a preaching battle. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, I, I think I can preach better than you. And I'm like, <laughs> if you think you can preach better than me, that's awesome. Yeah, but I said, it. you and me, I'm, I'm not going to compete in a preaching battle. Uh, I got more, more things I just want to do on mission than rather see who's a better communicator. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I'm not threatened by that. Like, because I know who God's created me to be. Cause I'd tell you, tell you and many people there's better preachers than me. I'm like, yeah. like if I thought I'm the best preacher, I'm in trouble. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm only bringing it up, not 
you know, just about my circumstance, but, um, you know, when you see in the ministerial world, when you're looking for a position, you know, usually there's this laundry list of expectations, you know, and it's like for $35,000 a year, you have to do <laughs> Walk this. on water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's probably a little more than that now, but not probably not much more. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, and it's like master's degree, doctoral student, you know, it, you have to have a theological bend. You have to be, you know, reformed or, or in the Pentecostal world, you have to, you know, have the gifts of the spirit and, and speak in tongues, whatever fill in the blank. Um, we've pre-qualified most pastors out of even applying. And that's really what I'm getting at is we wonder where all the pastors are. It's because we've terrified them. You know, the guys that are, are probably gifted and they have the heart of a shepherd and they're, they're good with people. They're known in their community. They love the Lord. They care about people. They can open up the word and talk about it intelligently. Maybe right now they're only doing it in a Bible study. But where's the mentoring and the enabling of the new interns? Like <clears throat> not everybody who becomes an intern is going to become a preacher. But man, oh man, if we don't have them coming in the door how in the world are we going to equip the church? Because we're, more doors are closing than opening right now. Yeah. But it's that mindset that we've had to qualify a pastor to be this big thing instead of just loving Jesus, wanting to dig deeper and equipping them to do so, but doing it practically in ministry right now instead of saying, go away and come back in five years yeah. and then we'll consider you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's where... <clears throat> I think it's seeing giftings, especially in, in, in individuals, and then going, how do I help them and how, how do I help bring them along? Because not all pastors, for example, have to go to seminary, yeah. and not all pastors have gone to seminary. Uh, and that's why, again, going back to that calling, like, have you been called to do this? And I go, if you have, then God will give you the ability through his spirit to do what he's asked you to do. Uh, so I would always, I always tell people, like, <laughs> I'm not brilliant. I'm not a scholar, but there are people who are really good at going and breaking down like, and we have our friend Sean, right? Yeah. We mentioned earlier. So there, there's people like that who, who can do that well. Uh, but then there's other things to preaching. So I, I go preaching is the proclamation. Teaching is the transfer of information. Yeah. So as a preacher on Sunday, my gifting lies more in preaching proclamation proclaiming the proclamation of the gospel and to get that out and and do that by capturing people through the spirit's work yeah I, you're I, talking about getting a response out of people yeah it's so the application you got it so yeah. i'm i can take a passage make it very applicable and simple but that's the way my mind works yeah. whereas like some people can keep it really deep but sometimes it flies over the average person's head but what they said is still valuable it's yeah. just how does that go if you were in seminary, that would have been really helpful. Yeah. Like those are things where I just go depending on the gifts. So one's not better than the other. It's just, here's the gift the spirit gave you. Here's your personality into it. Uh, one of the, one of the, uh, I'd say deepest thinkers I know, he just stood behind a pulpit like this yeah. and taught like that didn't move. Whereas others they you know, I remember <laughs> Uh, this guy preaching, he's getting all worked up, meaning like sweaty, off came the coat, then the tie, the tie would come yeah. off. By the end of it, he's <clears throat> preaching in his dress pants and t-shirt because <laughs> yeah. he's walked the stage probably a thousand times. And it was great preaching. Yeah, uh, What he was saying was powerful. And then I just go, that's personality, right? Yeah. And who God created you to be coming out. Exactly. But I think we need all of it is essentially. So if you're, if you're, um, you know, a leader in a ministry and sorry, I'm talking more to pastors than the people and we'll get back to that. But, um, <clears throat> you have to really have, uh, you have to shepherd the flock, which means that you need people to be fed in different ways. You can't just have a whole room full of theologians. You have to have people with heart and people with head and people that connect the, the two, it has to be all of it. And it's funny because as you're talking, I'm picturing how different you and Sean and I are mm -hmm. and how God orchestrated a collective that we didn't yeah. um, through random circumstances. And they're entirely complementary. and you can't wire 
equipment up, but I can't preach the way you can and shepherd people. And, and I can't remember things like Sean can. It's, it's funny how God sort of takes all of that and turns it into something that we could never manufacture. So yeah. I think as, as leaders in churches, we need all of that. Yeah. And that's why we've been saved into a body. Yeah. And that's why when a, when a church body works together on mission, functioning in their giftings, things don't fall through the cracks. Now, if I was to be, for example, the administrator, the scholar, hmm. right, the counselor, all wrapped up in one, something's going to drop. I, I can't manage all that. So the diversity of giftings is so key in a local body. And then the freedom to exercise, for example, those spiritual gifts and use them is, is where the power's at. So I just go like, God's given you a gift or gifts find out what that gift is and then just use it. And, and if you know it's a gift, you, by like I go in my 40s now, I've, I've hit a stage where uh, if someone says that was a great sermon, it, it doesn't puff me up. Yeah. And if someone says that was the worst sermon I ever heard, it doesn't destroy me. Right. Yeah. Whereas when I was first working through this in ministry, like sometimes that you, it would when you're 24 and someone's like, that's the best sermon I ever heard. You're like, oh, really? You internalize it. Yeah. And then yeah. you start going, OK, what did I do? And then how do I replicate? Yeah. That? And then yeah. you go back to it. And then all of a sudden someone's like, that was horrible. I didn't like anything about it. And then you feel like, should I even be doing this? Or, or people are walking out in the middle of your sermon. <laughs> yeah. So so all of that stuff comes into play. But I go as as you recognize more and more. Uh, without the spirit of God empowering me and gifting me, I could never do that. So mm. that's why I go, the sermon's powerful because when God's word is opened and proclaimed, the spirit of God's the one who carries it to different hearts. Yeah. And he has a way to dig deep into. So I've had people like, how did you know I was going through that? I didn't tell you anything. I'd be like, I, I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, this is where the Spirit of God led me. Uh, this is what I'm proclaiming. And that's God at work through his word. Yep. And um, you had talked about um, how our cult culture loves rugged individualism. Uh, I can do it by myself and I don't need anybody else to help. Do, do you want to expand on that a bit? What is rugged individualism? <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Like where I was going with that is that we we would take God's word, interpret it in the way we think we need it. So we're like, OK, and then we take that for ourselves and we're like, that's what it's saying. And then what I found out is when you start talking about it in community, it might actually go deeper than just what you thought. So I go, I think a lot of times in our culture, what we do is we we just interpret things on our own and we we be, can become somewhat closed-minded and then that's the danger sometimes because then we go well i'm right <clears throat> and then when you're in community and let's say you talk about a passage you're like oh i never even considered that i never thought about that so i go that's the application of god's word now coming you're like oh man that impacted me in this way but over here this individual in connect group saw something that impacted them and then god wraps it all up and goes i'm going to use my word to get everyone <laughs> yeah uh, and then you flesh that out in community rather than just as an individual so when i hear something in a sermon that convicts me and challenges me i like there's moments i've gone down if i was listening to a podcast or watching a sermon online i i've stopped and i went downstairs i'm like jess I just heard this mm -hmm. and I start sharing it and then Jess has some feedback yeah. because there's an excitement that I'm like, I want to share what just happened. Especially if it's answering a question that you may have not even realized you're pondering and then somebody just articulates it exactly how you wanted to comprehend something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, going back to the passage in verse um, three and four, it says explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, because this is Paul preaching to them. And we were saying how they were in tune. They were interested. The Bereans were interested in listening. <clears throat> this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the, the leading and not a few 
of the leading women. Um, but focusing more on the, some of them were persuaded. So they were sort of at the edge of their seat. They were taking mm. it in. So we just came from a place where they wanted them killed yeah. <laughs> and flogged and thrown in jail and everything. And then they come to this place and they're like, they're like that um, church that you always want to go to if you're a missionary, for example, yeah. on furlough. And they're like, man, I can't wait to get to this place because they're, I'm going to be blessed by just being present. Uh, as a musician, I remember some places I went to where they would give me clothing, food, and a place to sleep, and pizza, and everything. And I'm like, man, oh man, I just want to be with them. Well, yeah. <clears throat> so it must have been energizing for them to go from a place of, like, we hate you, to tell me more, because that's the sense I'm getting from this. And per the word persuaded to me, um, I don't have the translation in front of me, but that's more than I heard you. That's, I was, I'm compelled to believe you is what I get from the word persuaded. Yeah, there's a response yeah. to what they were proclaiming. Yeah. Um, but then later, in verse yeah. 5, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, um, the group, they formed a mob. So again, like, here's here's the Jews not getting it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know any other way of putting it. So, and we often get that, and I know I'm veering off of, like, this is just my brain and how I'm processing all of this. I'm trying to picture myself in the moment. I'm like, come on, really? Like, you you people should know better, right? And here you are, I've got these people that are, are just ripe for understanding and comprehending and having this, this new life in Jesus. And you're trying to snuff it out. Mm. You know, we, we tend to get those people in church. And I'm using... You know, I'm going to get canceled like Don Cherry for saying yeah. you people. <laughs> but I mean, what I mean by you people is those that are not interested. They're only interested in the structure of church. They're not even paying attention to the sermon. They're there for them and yeah. what they can take from it. Um, fill in the blank. Um, whatever the motivation of some people is, um, there's there's a, a huge draw for certain types of people to enter church buildings for other purposes. Mm. And that's kind of like the mob distraction I see here. And we see it play out in our churches here in PEI where there, there's this like traveling, roving group of, or, or random individuals, for example, that have an ulterior motive. They're not there to learn. Um, so that's a struggle that we face on a Sunday morning where you have different types of people in the same room. Some are going to listen and pay attention and others are not even there for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and how do you struggle through that as a preacher when you're looking across the flock? Yeah, I think the only thing is to set an example, right? That is, and and then to encourage people who would be involved in a service to be like, we're here for we're here for one purpose, and that's to make much of Jesus. So in our singing, it's not about how well we played together and did we hit all the right notes. It's was Jesus glorified in my preaching was God's word open was it declared faithfully was it proclaimed with with a, with a joy with a passion with a conviction and at the end of it all if we could wrap that up in our churches and go yeah we did everything we could to shine the light on Jesus that's all that matters it's not man did you see my did you hear my guitar solo today <laughs> uh, it's being engaged because if we believe that when we gather for example I and I, I, I know in scripture it speaks that God God shows up in 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 these moments. He's he's always present, but there's moments in in a Sunday service where I think if we were more sensitive to what the Spirit of God was doing, things would open up. I think sometimes we get focused on what we're doing that sometimes we miss out on what the spirit of God is doing. Yeah. The mechanics and the production of it all. Yeah. And I don't mean production for show, but production is in, we have to go from this to this to this because worship is orderly, but, but are we looking for those moments in between that order to allow the Holy spirit to work? If you see somebody struggling or if we have to stop and pray um, or even just taking time after and recognizing that there's opportunity. Um, yeah, and that being the being in the community part with people and understanding people's hearts um, really can make you sensitive as a pastor to be more 
um, more free to take a moment yeah. if you need to interrupt yourself basically is what I'm saying yeah so it's it's really encouraging people as they come they're coming to encounter a God who's very real and present so no matter if you're involved for example in serving in the service or if you're coming to sit there and in a way participate and take it in there's this promise that that God is willing to open up areas of your heart and life mm. to show you things that you need to know and he has a way of linking the music to the word to what was said to maybe that's the third time you heard it this week or even mm -hmm. how you were greeted when you came in or left yeah. you got it so i i just I just encourage people to come. And, and I think that's what the Bereans was like, there's an eagerness. And then when God shows up and does something and they were persuaded, like, like they did some work, they, they went back, they researched stuff that was preached and declared. They were like, does this line up? Is this true? Yeah. Comparing to what they'd have been taught been what, yeah, in yeah. the past. Right. So I just go like, are we doing that work? Like, okay. Like, that impacted me today. I know God wants me to do something about it. I'll do that later. Mm -hmm. And then what we find out is our later never comes. So you could hear something on Sunday morning and be like, well, tomorrow I'm going to study that more, read that more. And then it's three months later and you didn't do anything with it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're, and I've been one of those people. So I can say this honestly, where church wasn't the most important thing in my life and it was more about ease and comfort and I just not feeling it today and all that kind of stuff that happens um, <clears throat> when I was just attending a church um, actually there was a few churches where I ended up being in that mindset um, where I just wasn't getting anything out of it but then I realized that I was actually just being selfish because I wasn't feeding into anything either I wasn't trying to get in community I wasn't trying to know people I was trying to sneak in sneak out and be done yeah. and basically live in a religious state so that I didn't go to hell, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, um, which not a fun way to live. <laughs> no, no, because it's, it's lonely. You're lonely. And even if you can, if you get to a gathering, but you're not in community, you can do that. You can show up and leave, mm -hmm. but never be in community. And so why is the commitment to consistently getting into community so important? Yeah. Cause I, I go, if, if all we're getting, you know, I get that we have our individual walk, so we should be reading, praying, engaging God's word throughout the week that way. But then I go, if all we're getting in a way of community is Sunday morning and what happens in that service, you're an anemic, yeah. you're an anemic Christian, meaning that's not enough to sustain you. Mm -hmm. So what I found is the hard work is like going to a connect group. But then you find out it's not as hard as I thought. And then you build, just have to show up. You just have to show up, build yeah. relationship. And then you start like the, the neat thing at center point is that you go deeper into the passage from Sunday. So on Tuesday night in, in the Montague area, on Thursday in the Charlottetown area, we take that passage. We have questions that are applicable to life and then we talk it through and i go that's where we start to see scripture now go a little deeper mm -hmm. and now i start to in a way work that through with a group of people and i hear their perspectives it opens up my mind to things i never really heard before uh, or thought of before and or, or god's trying to tell you something in your study about the people that you're supposed to shepherd yeah because right? preaching is is not just information like you said you got it yeah yeah so so then i go that's the good thing about community as a as a preacher as someone prepping a sermon it like i've been asked like what's your what would be the biggest thing in your sermon prep and i always tell people it's it's prayer yeah so i'll pray before i prep i'll pray throughout it and then on saturday i pray through my message i go through it point by point line by line and i'm like all right god i'm open to if you want me to change this i'll change it if you want me to add this i'll add it and then while i'm communicated communicating the sermon i'm open to the spirit going i don't want you to say that i want you to go over here and say this which goes back to what we talked about right at the beginning yeah, yeah. and or and it's when i've gotten off of my my in a way prepared notes yeah 
where now the spirit of God's starting to open up some doors mm -hmm. in people's hearts and lives. And there's things I've said, and I have no clue why I'm going to say it, but at the end of service, someone will come up and they'll be like, you know what, when you were saying this, it opened up my heart and mind to this. And then you go, that's why. Yeah. That's what God was doing. So I go, as a communicator, there's this prayer, uh, reliance on prayer and reliance on the spirit. And yeah, do the hard work. So I, I say, I have enough stuff in my sermon. If I wanted, I could preach three hours. Oh, yeah. I don't. But if I, if I had to, I could. And if people were willing to listen to it and we had the facility where if you're time in Puerto was Rico, <laughs> yeah, like, like stuff like that, I just go, but I'm so glad I studied it. So when I don't get to communicate at all, I don't feel disappointed. I'm like, man, I got so much out of this and it impacted my life so much that who knows down the road, mm -hmm. what's going to come out of all that. Well, and that's what a, a, a movie editor has to do. The, the power of an editor f with, mm -hmm with filming a movie, how much stuff that people put time and effort into that ends up on the cutting room floor. Exactly. Yeah. But you're, you're telling the story though. And if I'm to link the two, you're doing in real time what, what an editor would do for a film. Right. Yeah. But you have to do it live. Yeah. And that's why the Holy spirit should be the editor. Yeah. So when he's, he's putting on your heart and you're like, even you're preaching in the moment, you're like, I know I sense I need to go here. Yeah what I've learned is when you step out, it's worth it. Yeah. Rather than no, I studied this. I prepared this. I don't want to get away from it. And then I think we take away some of the power and what the spirit of God really wants to do. Yeah. You've gone into autopilot. Yeah. yeah. Because I have all my notes. It's all here. there. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens is I might get over here speaking what the spirit of God really put on my heart in that moment. And then half the sermon might not get yeah. preach but i'm okay with that now when i was younger that was harder because i was fearful it's fear yeah to step out because what if i step out for example and i and i go blank yeah and then you had to deal with again your that awkward <laughs> pause of finding your notes <laughs> yeah then you got to come back here you're like uh, yeah i've always found <laughs> honesty is what gets you back though because you can say you know i I must have just gone down a bunny trail here. Let me regather my thoughts. I'm going to walk back yeah. and I'm going to check my notes here. And that people tend to feel sorry for you yeah. in those but moments. If, but if it's Holy Spirit led, you won't be in that moment. If yeah. it's not Holy Spirit led, that's where I'm like, all right, that's terrifying. Yeah. Because then I'm like, what did I just say? And what was the point of what I just said? And those well, are and, dangerous. And moments. the humility of recognizing that I... I went into self mode and now I have to get back into Jesus mode. Yes. <laughs> so, so true. Yeah. And then, um, as we, as we close kind of ending off with, um, like the best meal you ever ate, um, did you want to uh, walk through, um, how that relates? Yeah. I, I, I go, there's some like as a listener. So if we're going to grow through listening, there's some sermons that really stick with you. So I have sermons in my life where I, like I, I still remember them. One of the big, I'll just share one. Like yeah. one of the biggest ones was in uh, 2011. It was Tim Keller in uh, Chicago. He was preaching and I was there and he was talking about like the, uh, the Israelites going through the Red Sea on dry ground. And he was making this point that like some walk through that sea when it was parted very like oh no when are the waves going to come down i'm going to die and others walk through it with full confidence like look at my god and he's basically saying who got to the other side both people yeah so it's not so much about how much faith you build up it's about your god leading you and the way he worded it and put it together i remember i stood up and i just started clapping mm -hmm. and, and there's a few who stood up because it was such a powerful point in the way he proclaimed it and it came out led to this response so yeah. so i go like that's a special sermon to me yeah because it, it it impacted my life in a powerful way so i just go like i remember that but that doesn't sustain me because there's like uh, i said sunday i've listened to over 4,200 sermons, if not much. more. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of my rough calculation through my life. Yeah. So I don't remember all of those sermons, but I remember some of them. I remember that. So I go, it's like meals, right? Like you have certain meals that you've eaten in your life that you still remember because it was so good. Yeah. And, and uh, 
you just go, that was a special meal. But here's the thing. I've eaten probably three meals a day for most of my life. I, I know it sustained me. I can't tell you what all those meals are, yeah. but I can tell you some special ones that stood out. And it's like the word of God. So when the word of God is proclaimed, uh, there's going to be moments where I really grab it. And I'm like, that impacted me. This is sort of an aha moment. And then there's ones where I'm like, I sat through it. But it's porridge. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like spectacular in a way. Yeah. But what was said was truth and it was good. So I, I think that's what we got to think about is like the word of God ultimately will feed us, sustain us mm -hmm. if we do the work of applying it. So off of Sunday, as a listener, I would encourage people to take what they hear, go home with it in a way, chew on that, then break it a part in connect group and go, Oh, I never thought about that. And other people now are speaking into it and then go, how does that even now look and apply to my life? So if we were doing that work, I think the word of God then becomes life. Yeah. yeah. Well, you landed with James one twenty two. do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. The apostle writes, do what it says. So, <clears throat> you're you're just deceiving yourself if all you ever do is take it in and don't actually respond to it or do anything about it then it, it's just talk but it's living and active right so the holy spirit's supposed to empower you because you've heard the word and maybe it's a it's a mixture of being in community prayer encouragement preaching music and worship and all of that combined the synergy of it all the yeah. sum is greater than the parts right um <clears throat> god is using all of that and i think that's why um, community is linked to the learning part because if we're not in community growing together or being challenged together or mourning together or celebrating together then it's a pretty lonely experience and for those that that say me and jesus are good <laughs> i'm just going to do it from my living room um, I would say that's a failed argument. Yeah. yeah. You can't justify it. No. So I think um, if we, the next step from preaching, if we're doing it right, is applying. And then if we're applying, we're just naturally, it's going to be an outpouring of our life. And, and then we're going to remember things that you may have said. And now you're into a real life experience where I have to deal with this. And, but you've been equipped and God used you as a communicator or somebody in a small group to encourage, to say, you can do this. And then you get into a circumstance in life where you actually have to practice it, but you've been cheered on already because of community.